My name is Ed Boyden. I'm an associate professor here at the MIT Media Lab and the MIT McGovern Institute, directing a neurotechnology group here, the Synthetic Neurobiology Group. We'd love to encourage you to come to this Congress on June 15th and 16th in Lincoln Center in New York City. The brain is an incredibly densely packed and complicated high-speed machine. So in a cubic millimeter of tissue, you're going to have perhaps 100,000 cells connected by 900 million connections between them. One of the critical things that we want to do is be able to input information into the cells of that network. In other words, um, sort of entering information like running software on a computer. And that's important not only to reveal how the brain works, but also so that we can fix it and repair it, repair computations that are broken. So one way to do that is to realize that since neurons compute using electricity, if we can put molecules into the neurons that convert light into electricity, then we can shine light or even scan it around to target individual cells and turn them on or off. To do that, we've been borrowing tools from the natural world because there are lots of critters out there that do photosynthesis or that sense light, and they do that by converting light into electricity. So we put those molecules into neurons. We can then use light to turn those neurons on or off and thereby dial information into the brain. One of the things that we think a lot about is this concept that we like to call the brain coprocessor, a machine that can connect to the brain, observe the information in the brain, compute the information that needs to be computed, and then enter information back into the brain. You can imagine many practical uses for such a thing, not only for understanding the brain, but imagine in disorders like Alzheimer's disease or stroke, where large circuits of the brain are lost, how do you replace those functionalities? And of course, if you can replace parts that are lost by parts that are easier to upgrade in the future, that's always a great design principle for bioengineering. So to do that, we are working on technologies that allow us to observe many of the neurons in an area of the brain. Uh, Ultra-dense uh, probes that are made out of novel materials and that have uh, com computational power embedded within them. They then compute what needs to be computed and then insert information back in using light. So it's a two-way brain-computer interface that allows us to uh, create machines that can work side by side with the brain in a fully integrated fashion. And already we're doing such tests in animal models uh, but we take the, the translational side of going into humans quite seriously. A cubic millimeter of brain tissue has about 100,000 cells. A thousand of those will give you a cubic centimeter, say the scale of a mouse brain. And a thousand of those would be something approximating the scale of a human brain. And so we are trying to hit milestones where we can actually start to interface to an entire cubic millimeter in the very short term. Uh, we're doing this uh, work as we speak, aiming to hit the scale of 10 to the fifth to 10 to the sixth probes. Um, if that works, we, we'll be able to modularly scale this up because all of our devices are built to be modular, scalable, and to, uh, to take advantage of Moore's Law and effects of microfabrication that allow us to continue to pack elements closely together. And so if we are able to keep pace, one hope is that we can uh, logarithmically, lo logarithmically increase the number of sites um, over uh, uh, you know, a few years per, per log unit. So in that case, optimistically, we're talking about um, within a few decades, pessimistically, perhaps, um, a few times more than that. The goal is really to be able to record cells throughout a significant fraction of the brain. Um, hopefully you don't have to record every single cell, but there's, you know, there's obviously some redundancy associated with interconnectivity of, of these uh, modular brain circuits. Uh, if we can do that, then all sorts of new opportunities arise. Of course, you can start to interface those cells to, to machines, but then interesting philosophical experiments start to, that are currently thought experiments, start to arise. So suppose that if you lose a brain structure due to Alzheimer's or stroke, you can replace that by a computer. What happens if you start to replace other structures as they're lost by computers? What happens? Is there a, a convergence point where suddenly you find yourself running the brain on a computer? And so one of the hopes is that, although we're devising these uh, technologies to confront very, very real and immediately needed clinical scenarios, because we're designing this in the fashion of, of, of engineering disciplines, potentially they can scale to uh, potentially significant fractions of the brain, or one can imagine you know, maybe even entire brains at some point in the future. Since the brain is at the heart of identity and our emotions and how we think, focusing innovation on improving uh, health through looking at the brain is a really powerful way to go. So uh, one of our hopes is to be able to create interfaces of the brain that allow the replacement of senses, the ability to control the outside world, uh, and to be able to augment performance in the brain by adding capabilities in the short term with of course, people who have disability, but if we look at human history, technologies that are used to help people with disability or with, with, with medicine, if they are shown to be safe and effective over time, find increasing uses. And we even see that nowadays with pharmaceuticals and with prosthetics and so forth. And ideas that might have seemed crazy 20 years ago, like having wearable computers, um, now we all have one or more computers on us and nobody thinks twice about it. So I think tapping into the natural trajectory of humans to augment themselves is a really powerful human and societal trend. So one of the hopes is that we can start to think about 
uh, us and our world as seamless extensions of, uh, of humanity. And, and if we can start to think about the things that we do and the things that we work with as extensions of ourselves, that's a, it's a, a mental shift that allows us to really uh, change how we think about what to fix. I'll give you an example. Uh, for people who have a disability, one way to think about it is a disability for the loss of a leg or something like that. But you can also think about the disability as a disability of the world, which is not compatible with a certain kind of interaction with it. And so by fixing the world and repairing it, um, you end up with a, a paradigm shift that allows you to make the entire operation of civilization um, better, as opposed to fixing something that might just be uh, uh, a transient one-off uh, fix. So can we repair the world as an extension of ourselves? One of the most important things that we could do is to find ways to help people from different engineering backgrounds, material science, chemistry, synthetic biology, and experts in all of the problem spaces, different neurodegenerative disorders, experts in understanding the biological pathways that lead to um, the changes in brain, both positive and negative. And we need to find ways to optimally, combinatorially link people in networks that allow them to go out and solve problems. So one thing that I think a lot about is uh, how do I sort of curate innovation? How do you put together these dynamic teams to go solve a problem? One thing that is clear is that because we don't know enough about the brain in order to completely uh, simulate it or completely interface to it today, is that there's going to be serendipity involved. And so what we need to do is to have very flexible dynamic teams that can reconfigure and be able to bring whatever technology is needed to bear upon whatever problem is at hand. And that suggests a new kind of scalable project, one that's more flexible, more dynamic, more agile, and able to, and able to take new disruptive innovations into stride and then use that in the context of some problem-solving um, environment to, to, to rapidly change. Unlike some projects, like landing on the moon, uh, where the goal might be pretty clear, you know, for the brain, we don't necessarily know what abstraction layer is most important. Could we do it completely non-invasively, or do we need to know where every molecule is? What that suggests is that we need a very rapid invent, try it out, evaluate cycle, and to be agile in our ability to shift as new insights come online. Um, and I think that is possible. I think that we can find people who want to collaborate in these networks. And already we have a pretty large neurotechnology network that's emerged out of our efforts with in vivo robotics and optogenetics and 3D brain interfacing. And even now we're branching out into other areas uh, such as synthetic biology machines uh, that can be used to observe neurons, new kinds of microscope that can go at extremely high speeds. And all of this is done sort of in this distributed network of people who like to work together on these problems because they understand the impact of what they're doing. So one hope is by thinking about um, the body and brain as an integrative system, maybe we can tackle problems that are, are very difficult to tackle by focusing on one thing alone. And that will provide a lot of motor force for people to work together on the intact organism, the intact human, as a system to be engineered. One hope that I have is that we'll build enough technologies that allow us to interface and understand and analyze and control functions and to fix them. And that platform will become a platform that people can then use uh, as building blocks for fundamentally new innovations, maybe innovations that we don't even anticipate at the current time.